right. So there we are. Let's continue. So hello boosters, we are now second segment there of this products too. So when we talked about the pericardium and the respiratory system. So I, I want to talk about the respiratory system in this segment. Anyway, so we have the trachea there, right? Bifurcating at the carina to give the, the right principal bronchus and the left, okay? Right principal bronchus and the left. Okay, so there we have the right principal bronchus and the left into the uh, right lung and the left lung, okay? Right, now, so the respiratory system, this is how it is. So the trachea extends from the level of C6, right? Just below the thyroid cutlet, okay? So uh, C6 there, right? Cervical vertebra number six, up to T4 and T5 junction, that's at the carina, okay? So that's the trachea, okay? Then its length is, you know, 11.25 centimeters, but I want you to get something. So for you not to complicate up stuff, if you want to say 11.25 centimeters, it may seem like it's so difficult, all right? Okay, Quickly, uh, okay so I'm just like eating these guys. Um, what you can just do is to say the trachea is approximately 11 centimeters, okay? Why, because this is just an average, right? There's variation in the population. So you just say it's approximately 11 centimeters. Then it's approximately 2.5 centimeters wide. Okay. Are we together? Then the carina is not fixed. Okay. So the carina, right, that bifurcation point is actually Out. not fixed, right? Out, please mute the mic, Diago. Right. May we please mute the mic there? Right. So the carina is actually not fixed. Right. right? So that in expiration, right? So that in expiration, right, it ascends from T4 and T5 uh, junction, right, to actually, T3, right, to actually go to T3 there, all right, right. Claiming with the mic there, right, and then in inspiration, so in inspiration, right. In deep inspiration there, we actually have the carina descending to T, T6. Are we together, right? Are we together? So remember that I said the carina there, right, uh, is at T4 and T5. So the bifurcation is at T4 and T5, but in expiration, it may move actually to T3. And then in inspiration, it can actually move to T6 there, okay? Right. Then, the trachea divides into right and left principal bronchus. All right, then let's look at the structure of the trachea actually. So if I cut transversely the, the trachea, what I see is that it's an incomplete C, uh, it's an incomplete tube and it's made up of C rings, all right? C rings of island cartilage, right? So if I say incomplete, that means if I cut transversely, what I see is that I have a, a ring, a C-shaped ring of island cartilage, right? C-shaped ring of hyaline cartilage. So that is the, uh, the, the canal there, right? It's actually incomplete, right? And then it's completed posteriorly by a muscle that we call the trachealis muscle, right? So this muscle is so simple. You don't even know, need to know the origin and the insertion. So the trachealis muscle, right? So they will be having the trachealis, the trachealis muscle completing posteriorly there, right? The trachealis muscle. This is, an, this is actually an advantage. Why? Because posterior to the trachea, remember, we have the esophagus there, right? We have the esophagus. So imagine if we were to have um, cartilage at this point, right? What we have? Compression of the esophagus. We actually have compression of the, of the esophagus. So I say that here, right? It's actually 2.5 centimeters wide, right? I would get that. So there's just a transverse section that I've cut here. So actually cartilage, island cartilage completed posteriorly by the, 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 the trachealis muscle, all right? So we have the esophagus in contact with the trachealis muscle there, all right? I would get that. Then the esophagus is located posteriorly along all of its, of its length there, 
Are we together? Right. Then, having said that now, um, we need to note the differences between the principal bronchus, the two principal bronchi that will be given. So we need to understand the difference there. So remember, we have the right principal bronchus and we have the left principal bronchus, all right? So we are dividing into a right principal. That's a trachea at the carina there, right? We are dividing into a right uh, principal bronchus there, right? And a left principal bronchus. So if you see, there's a difference, right? In the structures that I've drawn here, right? So let's look at that now. We actually see that the right principal bronchus, it's shorter, all right? The right principal bronchus, it's actually shorter. So can you see that the length here, it's shorter, right? Right and the left there. So the right, it's actually shorter, right? Than the left one. So the left one is longer than the right one. And then, in terms of uh, you know the, the the internal diameter, we actually see that the right principal bronchus is wider. So you see that it's actually wider, right, than the left one. So it's actually wider than the left one. All right, and then the left one is narrow. Right, good. Then in terms of being vertical or horizontal, right, we actually see that the right one is more vertical. So you see that the right one is more vertical. So can you see, can you see its angle there compared to this guy? So that one is more horizontal, okay? So that, these are the differences that you have to note. Please, you have to know this. So I'll repeat, okay? So I say that, Difference between the, the left and the right bron uh, principal bronchus is that the right one is actually shorter, right? And then the left one is actually longer, right? And then the right one is actually wider, right? And then the left one, it's, it's actually um, narrow, okay? And then here, it's more vertical and this one is more horizontal, okay? By the angles there. So there we have the carina, right? There we have the, the carina. All right. So there we have it, right? Um, we have to take some time Question. on this diagram, right? So we really have to take some time on this diagram. So this is the trachea, right? We have the trachea there, dividing, right? Into this short guy, right? Well, uh, they mislabeled there, actually mislabeled. It's actually supposed to be the right, not left there. Hello, Wena, textbook. Right, admit. So that one is the left prop. Right, so this one is actually the right. So you see that the textbook can also make mistakes, right? Right. So actually shorter, right? It's actually shorter, right? And that one is what? Longer, right? Now we're together, right? And this one is more vertical and that one is more horizontal, right? Yeah, they didn't show much of them, the difference. Okay. Yeah. But I'm not a question. Ah, oh, you guys. Okay, ask. Ask. Her. Uh huh. What is the significance of the differences? Sorry. My difference is that the principle of the brain. Any my any any significance? Any. Yes, we look at the clinical significance. Okay, right, thanks. That's why I said, uh, sorry, I didn't see uh, that. I'll, I'll, I'll actually look at that. Okay, so there we have the left one longer, this one shorter, right? And I want you to, to understand the relations, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, we have the azygous vein here, right? We actually have the azygous vein over here, right? Exactly below the line, red reaper carina, right? So we can't find it in superior mediastinum. So it's draining into the uh, superior vena cava, okay, which is uh, anterior here. So it actually has to jump, right, over the right principal bronchus, okay, to be able to drain into the superior vena cava that will be located here. Are we together? Right. So that is the relation. So if they ask you the relations, I can go to the right principal bronchus, and if they just say vena, uh, the, the azygous vein, right, the azygous vein or the vena azygous. That's true, okay? So it actually arches over, right? It's actually also a posterior relation there. It will be a posterior relation, right? Posterior relation, then it actually arches over that, okay? Right? 
And then the left one is related to what? The iota, right? So here we have the iota, there we have the azygous vein. So can you see that? It's so simple, right? And then the principal would divide into, uh, so the right one would divide into a superior lower branch, right? And then a middle lower branch and then an inferior. You understand why this one is giving three and this one is only giving two when, I, when we, we talk about the structures of the lungs actually, because the left lung only has got two lobes. Okay, so one, two, then the right, the right lung has got three, three lobes there. Okay, right. So these are the relations, right? Then let's look, who is this guy? So this is the pulmonary trunk coming from the heart, right? Then dividing into a left pulmonary artery and a right pulmonary artery there. So a left pulmonary artery and a right. And you have to understand this slope as well, right? So can you see that the left pulmonary, it seems like it's ascending, right? And this one, it seems like it's descending actually, right? So can we see that, right? This one looks like it's ascending. That one looks like it's descending, right? And and the way we would you know record this um, is is that the 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 right principal bronchus is more vertical, okay? So it would go with this guy, right? And this one is more horizontal, so obviously it will go with that guy, okay? Right? Fine. And this is blood coming from the heart to the lungs, carrying deoxygenated blood, all right? And then we see that posterior to this guy we actually have these veins that are coming to the heart, these four veins. So remember, they're coming to who? The left atrium. So remember the embryology, the left atrium, right? So they are coming from the lungs. Okay. So these are what we call the pulmonary, pulmonary veins. So they're actually four in number, two coming from this side, two coming from that side, all right? So this is just to help us appreciate the, the, the structures that are located uh, closer to the lungs. So this point, you'll be having a lung. So actually at this point, you're actually having a lung there and this point having a, a lung there, right? And then these structures are entering the lung. So these structures are entering the lung, right? At the root of the lung, right? Where the lungs are rooting. That you also can call the hyla. So that root can also be called the hyla of the, of the lungs. But remember, we have to appreciate the differences between the principal bronchi, right? And let's look at the clinicals now. Can you palpate the trachea on yourself? Yes, you can, right? You just go to the suprasternal notch, so that notch above the, the manubri, right? Then you press there, right? You find this cartilaginous feel, right? And that's your trachea. So yes, we can actually uh, uh, palpate there, right? So in surgery, you can actually uh, you know, go straight to the trachea there. Okay, then we can have compression, right? We can have compression of the trachea, we can have compression of the trachea there by aneurysm with the dilate, aneurysm just means dilatation, okay? Dilatation of the arc of the iota, right? Let's come here. So can you see the arc of the iota? Let's say the arc of the iota increases in, 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 in diameter, right? It dilates. What does it do? It pushes, right, on the trachea. Right, and one has problems of breathing there. One will actually have problems of breathing there, right? So aneurysm or dilatation of the uh, arc of the iota, right, dilatation, right, will compress the trachea. That dilatation will also compress who? The left principal bronchus. So if a question asking you, you know, dilatation of the arc of the iota can compress these following structures. And then they talk about the right principal you put a bold force, right? You actually put a bold force thing, all right? Now, which principal bronchus, that's a question now, which principal bronchus can be compressed by an enlarged one, arc of iota? Obviously, the left principal bronchus. So it's actually the left principal bronchus, and then we'd say that's true, okay? That is actually true for the left principal bronchus, right? Then, if we have a uh, dilatation of the azygous vein, right, which uh, 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 principal bronchus will be dead, will, will be compressed? It's actually the, the right, right? That is true. Okay, that is actually true there, right? And then, you know, those kids uh, that can inhale the 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 the, the foreign bodies, okay, so can inhale uh, either the nuts, okay. 
So they actually any foreign body like so this usually happens with children. They play with um, nuts or uh, maize there, right? And then they can actually inhale that, right? And then you suspect, right? Either it has gone to the right lung or it has gone to the left lung, right? You actually have to suspect. But you know, you'd say that, ah, uh, no. We suspect that you know there is high uh, uh, probability that this foreign body uh, or foreign substance that this uh, child has inhaled has gone to the right. Why? That's the question. Why? Because for this principal bronchi, the right one is the one which is more uh, vertical. So it's it's more like a continuation of the trachea. So it's more vertical, right? Compared to the to the to the left one. So it's more vertical compared to, to the left one. It's more vertical compared to, to the left one there, all right? And as well diameter, right? The diameter there, right? It is a larger diameter compared to the, to the, to the left one. So it, it, it is likely to go to the right lung. Why? Because it's more of a continuation of the tracking. Okay, so that substance just go straight into there, right? That is the clinical relevance uh, that you were asking there, my dear. Okay, so that is generally about the, the, the tract, respiratory tract. Okay, so that is basically about the um, respiratory tract there. Are we together, right? Then um, we go on to talk about the dura, right? We go on to talk about the dura there. So, we say that we have the mediastinum in between the pleura, right? So on either side of the mediastinum, we have the, the pleura, right? And the pleura are housing the lungs, okay? So they're housing the lungs, right? And remember, the lungs then are then covered. So the lungs also need a covering, right? Right. So remember when we did the layers, right, of the body wall, right? From the endothoracic fascia, right? From the endothoracic fascia, we had the parietal layer, right? Parietal layer of pleura there, right? And then um, we had the parietal layer of pleura. Then deep to that, we had the visceral layer of pleura. So deep to that, we had the visceral layer of pleura. And we said that the visceral layer is tethered to the whole lung. Okay, so the whole lung, right? The visceral layer is actually tethered to the whole lung so that the nerve supply for the visceral layer is the same nerve supplied to the lung, autonomic nerves. And then the nerve supply to the parietal is the same nerve supply to the body wall, okay? The intercostal nerves, all right? Then our pleura is divided, all right? So the pleura is actually divided. This pleura is divided into, so can you see that you have the ribs. So actually you'll be having ribs there, right? Actually be having ribs, ribs there, right? Ribs there. So this pleura, this pleura that is in association with the ribs or the costals, it's called the costal pleura. So that's actually what we call a costal, the costal pleura there. Okay, so that is what we call the costal, costal for the ribs, right? The costal pleura there. All right. Then here we have the diaphragm. Okay, so there we have the diaphragm underneath, right? So it's resting on top of the of the diaphragm. This pleura that we see here on top of the diaphragm, right, is what we call the diaphragmatic pleura. Diaphragmatic what? Pleura. So there, we have continuation there, right? So the, you know the diaphragm is originating, right? From the costal margins there, right? So there is what we call the diaphragmatic what? Pleura. And then we will go up, right? We will go up to the root of the lung, to the root of the, the lung. And remember, we have the mediastinum here. So this pleura is in contact with the mediastinum, right? So what we will call this pleura? It's called the mediastinal pleura. So this is called the mediastinal. So if I go there, right, that pleura, that one, it's a mediastinum. So this whole pleura here is the mediastinum pleura there. Are we together? So the mediastinum pleura, mediastinum pleura. So if structures passing into the lung, remember the principal bronchus, you know, the pulmonary veins and the arteries there, they're passing in, some are going out, right? The lymph nodes, you know, lymph vessels passing in are uh, going out as well, right? So that is for the pleura. Then also, this is what happens. For the visceral pleura, so the visceral pleura is following the lungs, right? It's actually following the lungs, go there as well, come to the hyla, 
right? For the root of the lung. What happens at the root of the lung? These two layers, they'll do something amazing. They'll actually be continuous together. So that's where they'll greet each other there. That's where they'll greet each other there, right? So Lee is raising her hand. Can you ask your question? All right. So they. Um, I wanted to ask what, what caused the relation of the iota? Sorry? What causes dilation of the iota? Dilatation of the iota. What causes dilatation of the iota? All right. Well, that can be, um, that is to go back to physiology, you know, cardiovascular physiology. So I won't go in depth there, right? But it's a problem with the histology of, you know, the, the iota on itself. Okay. All right. So the same thing that causes constriction, you know, of the arteries, right? The opposite of that will cause dilatation. I won't go deep into that. Okay. Right. So we said at the hyla of the lung, we have continuation of the visceral and the pareto pleura. The visceral layer and the pareto. They're actually being continued today at the hyla. Okay. That's amazing. So that we said that in between, in between these two layers, we have fluid. So in between these two layers, we also have what? Fluid there, right? So in between these two layers, we have fluid there, right? Right. And what we call this fluid? Yeah, the plural fluid. And it also that plural fluid there that we see there. Okay. About 10 to 15 mils. And it 10 to 15 mils there. And it right. So that is what we call the plural fluid. If they ask you, if they get to ask you which layer, right? Which layer um here. Which layer here secretes so between the parietal and the visceral layer? Which layer secretes this one? It's actually the, the visceral layer. Right. So, how do we please, how do we please? Right. 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 Now, um, so there we are. Um, so we said the visceral layer right, secretes this fluid, right? And we say that the visceral layer becomes a continuous at the hyla of the lung with the parietal, parietal layer. Okay, right. So that's the hyla of the of the lung there. All right. Now, that is about the the pleura and the nerve supply for the parietal. It's coming from the uh, somatic nerves, right? And then the nerve supply to this uh, visceral pleura, it's coming from uh, the, the autonomic nerves, right? Let me explain that. So here, remember, we have the intercostal nerves, right? We have the intercostal, intercostal nerves there, right? Supplying the intercostal muscles. So that those nerves will also supply the parietal layer, right? So which part of the parietal layer? The costal part of the parietal nerve, right? But these intercostal nerves, do they get to the diaphragm all this way? No. Right, this part of the diaphragm is supplied by those nerves that I talked about that are moving with the heart, right? Which are the the phrenic nerves, right? So the phrenic nerves come and also supply the the parietal layer, right? But the diaphragmatic parietal layer. Okay, so the diaphragmatic parietal layer, right? And then they also supply the mediastinal, the mediastinal uh, parietal layers. All right, the mediastinal parietal Layers. So you can see how simple it is. So the phrenic nerve comes, supplies there, supplies there, goes to the diaphragm, supplies the diaphragmatic of the parietal layer only. All right. Then the costals, the costals will also will be supplied by the intercostal side. Right? And then for the visceral layer, for the visceral layer, both is tethered with the lungs and they develop from the same area, right? They also develop from the same area. What we actually see is that. I actually see that the autonomic nerves, right? So the autonomic nerves, you know, also supply, that also supply the lungs, also supply the visceral layer, right? And then the, which autonomic nerves are these? Remember, is the vagus nerve, right? Plus the vagus nerve plus the sympathetic nerves. So we don't see any phrenic nerve there, okay? We don't see the phrenic nerve there. So that is about the pleura. Right, so there we have continuity. So can we see that we have continuity of the parietal and the visceral layer at the hyla of the lungs. 
Right. So there we have continuity there. So that's our land there. And then here supplied by the intercostal. And here supplied by the training beds as well. Right. Now, can someone just call out and tell them to right. then now um Let's talk about you know the differences between the two lungs before we go to the intricate differences there. So anyway, we have the pericardium here, and can you see that the, this pericardium now extends more to the left, right? Because that's where we have the apex of the heart there. Right? So it extends more to the left because that's where we have the apex of apex of the lung. Okay. So can you see that the left the left lung actually the left lung, right? The left lung will lift with a few minutes there, right? The left lung actually is a bit, you know, compressed, right, by this part of the ventricle there, right? So the left ventricle there, okay? Now we're together, right? So that's a fossa. So you see the fossa that's being created here. That's what we call the cardiac fossa there, right? The cardiac fossa there, all right? All right. I'll also tell you what is the notch as well. What is the cardiac notch there, right? Um. Having said that, so that will uh, create some differences between our two lungs, so that even when you're in spot test and it, you can see, oh no, this is a left lung, no, this is a right lung, by what? We also look at the differences between the hyla, right? There are some differences there in the arrangement of the structures at the hyla, right? And we also look at these structures there, right? This impression created by the heart, that impression created by the arc of the iota there, okay? So that's why we actually say that the left lung is smaller. So the left lung is actually smaller than the, the right lung, okay? We here we have an impression, but it won't be so deep like this one, right? Here we only be, have an impression of the superior vena cava and the azygous vein, right? But here we have a deeper impression because of the arc of the iota there, right? So this one creates an impression there. This one, the, the arc of the iota there creates an impression there. Right, so yeah, that's our cardiac uh, force there, right? Also creating a cardiac notch there, okay? Then the dooms, remember I said the right doom is at a higher level than the left doom, right? So the right doom is at a higher level, why? Because of the larger right lobe of the, of the liver, right? Larger right lobe of the, of the liver there. So if they ask you in terms of the length of these lungs, right? Who is shorter now? This guy is shorter, the right one. Even though he's larger, but he's shorter. Why? Because the, 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 the diaphragm, right? Is compressing this part, okay? So it's creating, you know, a, a deeper impression there compared to this doom there. So the left uh, lung is actually longer, right? It's actually longer than the right one, okay? Though, although it's it's actually uh, smaller than this one. Okay, so now there's no need to cram. Now you understand why is it like that. Are we together? And you said our lungs, they, you know, they cross, you know, they pass through the thoracic inlet there, right? To actually go into the region of the neck. Okay, so they're also structures of the neck. If they ask you questions in terms of maybe step wounds and if someone comes with a knife, steps there, right above rib number one, the following structures are likely to be damaged. If they say lung, don't be confused, say, ah, no, the lungs are found in thorax. Yes, they will be damaged today. Why was they also extend into the neck? And then we saw that, that the endothoracic fascia will actually thicken. The endothoracic fascia will thicken, right, to be called a suprapleural membrane. Are we together? To actually be called a suprapleural membrane there. Okay. So I said that. Remember that the mediastinum parietal pleura and the diaphragmatic parietal pleura are supplied by the phrenic nerves. The costals are supplied by the intercostal, intercostal nerves there, okay? That's the simplicity of that, okay? And what are the clinicals? What are the clinicals, right? We may have what we call pleural effusion, right? Okay, what do we have pleural effusion? So effusion, that means, you know, the pleural fluid, that fluid between the parietal layer and the visceral layer, you know, it's increasing in volume, right? So there's an increase in volume there, right? So that will lead to a uh, collapse of the lungs, okay? That will actually lead to collapse of the lung. Meaning that if I have so much 
we, I'm, I'm just supposed to have a thin layer of fluid in there, right? A thin layer of fluid, okay? A thin layer of fluid there. What actually happens is that fluid increases, right? They will push the lung inside, okay? So they'll actually push the lung inwards, right? So that is what we call the um, pulmonary uh, prolapse, okay? So they actually push um, the, 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 the lung as well inside. So efficiency of respiration is reduced as well, okay? Efficiency of uh, respiration is reduced, all right? Then we may also have inflammation. So whenever in anatomy or physiology, you get that uh, TIS, right? Or the TIS in front of any name there, then it's called inflammation. So it's just inflammation, right? So pleurisy, also known as uh, pleuritis, that is uh, inflammation, right? So that is inflammation of, of, of uh, the, the, the pleural layers, right? So this parietal layer and the visceral layer, they get inflammation. If there's an inflammation, there can be formation of fibrous tissue there, right? So that now we have reduced what lubrication there, and, it, and that causes rubbing, right? So when one is, is breathing, you can actually hear the sounds, right? Rubbing there, right? And that is what we call pleural rub, okay? Pleural rub and pleural adhesion. Adhesion, that is just, you know, they're, they're, they're tethered together because of, um, you know, the fibrous tissue that is been formed there, All right? Then we've got what we call pneumothorax, okay? We've got what we call pneumothorax there. So pneumo, that's air. So that is actually air within the, the pleural cavity there, okay? So within our pleural cavity there, right? Within that thin layer, if let's say one is given a, a step there, right? Air gets into, right? Mixes up with the serous fluid, right? That we call pneumo, pneumothorax, how together. So it's air within the thoracic what? cavity, and it specifically within this, uh, the pleural cavity there, right? So that is what we call the pneumo, pneumothorax. So because the step wound, right? If we have damage of the intercostal uh, 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 vessels, blood, right? Will also be seen within uh, that layer, right? You actually see pus as well within that layer, right? And serous fluid, obviously you see serous fluid because it's obviously there, okay? Right? Then we have this thing that we call tension pneumothorax, right? Tension pneumothorax. But if you understand this one, this principle, then you're very good there, right? Tension pneumothorax. This is compression of the contralateral lung due to ipsilateral lung collapse. All right. So they're just saying that if there is collapse over here, this wall part, right? This wall part there, right? Those wall mediastinum will be pushed towards the contralateral side. So that's the contralateral side. So if that's the right side, the contralateral side is the left. So can you see that this force that is generated here, you know, is transmitted to the pericardium, transmitted to the other lung there, right? And this lung, what happens to this one? Also collapses because it's being pushed by the heart there. Okay, right? That is what we call the tension pneumothorax. So it's compression of the contralateral lung due to ipsilateral lung collapse, right? And mediastinal deformities, right? Movement of the mediastinum. Then we have a, 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 a procedure that we call the thoractomy, right? So we want now to drain the fluid, that excess fluid or blood, right, out. So how do we do that, right? We make an incision, so we cut, make an incision, right, in the fourth or the fifth intercostal spaces. The fourth or the fifth, it's easier there, right? Because we don't have the pectoralis major, you know, covering much of the spaces there. The fourth and the fifth intercostal spaces, right? And we make that incision from the lateral edge of the sternum, right? But for you, there isn't much of, you know, the stuff that you have to get there, and it, but what you can just get is that thoracotomy is done within these spaces, right? Between the sternum, right? The sternum there, right? And the anterior axillary line, right? So just, we just meaning to, we do this procedure anteriorly on the chest wall, right? And then when we do that, we talked about this when we say the layers that we have to pierce up to we get to the pleural fluid, right? And then you have to prevent what? The internal thoracic vessels and nerves. If you damage the vessels, they, there is, you know, hemorrhage as well, okay? So you actually find more blood now leaking into that area. You also have to prevent the, um, the, the internal thoracic what? Nerves there, right? Are we together? Uh, uh, sorry, not the internal thoracic nerves, but actually the intercostals, right? The intercostal uh, nerves, you have to prevent them, right? 
And then when you are uh, making an incision lateral to the sternum, you have to prevent what? The internal thoracic attack, right? Because it is runs lateral to the sternum, right? And then when you're into the uh, intercostal space, you have to prevent what? The intercostal neurovascular structures, okay? So um, this is what we had to discuss on the day. I hope you got this well. Um, boosters, we have less than a minute left now. Um, so that is about uh, uh, respiratory tracts to go to the differences between the left and the right of bronchus and the, uh, the relations there, and then up to put the, the, the pleura and the nerve supply to the clinicals that we find there. So tomorrow we'll talk about the lungs, right, as well as introduction to um, the heart, Bye -bye. Well as, um, breathing mechanisms there.